I don't want to take up a lot more time, but I do want to uh, take this opportunity to just say um, what a pleasure it is to be here again in Chicago with all of these great minds who had so much impact on me as uh, a graduate student here, and, and especially Howard, who supervised my dissertation. Uh, like Eric, I, I really enjoyed his courses, but I guess um, Howard didn't see as much potential in me as he did in Eric, because uh, never helped me to have the same high standard. <laughs> <laughs> he gave you an A? <laughs> I was trying to avoid saying that. <laughs> Good, I was worried that wouldn't land. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I have the very great honor of uh, chairing um, the sessions for two of those professors who had great impact on me, um, both of whom are named Bill. And the first is um, the irrepressible Bill Limtat, who will no doubt take us on a whirlwind tour of engineering design principles in culture and in the architecture of nature. So uh, please a warm welcome for Bill Limtat. <coughs> privilege to be here uh, in a Beshrift, uh, uh, in effect, for Howard. Um, uh, when Howard came, uh, I discovered fairly quickly his critical uh, depth and, uh, uh, and encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, and I adopted the principle, and I tend, as you'll see here, I tend to be better at uh, reaching out and finding connections that people's work may have with other things. But I'm not so much of his, as a critic. Howard, however, uh, did a marvelous job, and I made sure that as many of my dissertation students as I could also had Howard on their committee. So, uh, so they came out with something that hopefully was both uh, well-grounded and far-reaching. Um, okay, well, this is about a five sigma outlier as far as subject matter for this conference. Um, uh, it ties in with two longer range uh, projects of mine. One is to look at generative entrenchment, about which you will hear more, that comes up in engineering and technology and culture, uh, in human cognition, uh, and in scientific change. Uh, the second is to look at cultural evolution. Uh, I'm not going to focus on either of those, but I'm going to stand back and come as close as I ever will to doing foundational work in some area. Uh, let's say it's foundational work perhaps in the sciences of the artificial or relatively far removed uh, applied stuff. But as Herb Simon said, uh, what's the artificial? Well, it's anything that's a product of natural selection. And with that, of course, it reaches very far from trial and error learning uh, to biological evolution. OK. So a number of features are characteristic of good design or are inevitable features of the design process, both in engineering and in organic nature. <coughs> they should be characteristic. Oh, wait a second, I forgot to say. This does tie into Howard's history in two ways, one of which I'm going to have to ask George to check me on. One is, in his dissertation, uh, of course, he has a, uh, a section on uh, 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 Erwin Schrodinger's uh, uh, um, uh, book, which I've now forgotten the title of. What uh, is what? What? Right. Uh, and secondly, it, am I right that Howard uh, uh, did programming for the PDP-2 when he was, uh, before he yes. was? Uh, I, yes, I think that's right. Yeah, right. Okay. I mean, we, we both have had conversations about programming in, in assembly language. Yeah, right. So Andre knows for sure. What? Andre knows for sure. Okay, so that's so that's it. I, uh, um, and so you'll see connections to both of those in um, uh, uh, in the stock. Okay, these engineering design principles should be characteristic of organization in any evolved system. Uh, I list some of these and then discuss several in more detail. And I try to say, in some sense, why they are so fundamental and unavoidable in complex adaptive systems. So I'm going to talk about generative entrenchment and self-organization. Um, I'm going to talk about robustness and recombination, um, uh, since recombination is one of the best ways of securing robustness. Um, I'm going to talk about modularity, but both bottom-up modularity, assembling things out of a bunch of parts, and also top-down modularity, 
uh, in which you have to be able to maybe select for individual traits of the system without messing up the rest. And then finally, evolvability or maintainability, although that would be more by uh, side reference. Uh, there's an important difference in remaining. That is, it isn't the case that all adaptive systems are alike. And in fact, organic systems are characterized also by metabolism, growth, and self-repair. And I don't, uh, and engineering systems at this point uh, are not capable of that. So, generative entrenchment. Um, Suppose we have an evolving adaptive system with a recurring developmental trajectory, a life cycle, and differential entrenchment generating different degrees of evolutionary conservation because modifications of more deeply entrenched elements, that is things with more things downstream of them in the developmental program, um, uh, uh, more de deeply entrenched things are more likely to fa uh, fail, uh, that is the modifications are more likely to fail, and to lead to bigger failures. They're thus more likely to be preserved and to acquire uh, further downstream dependent features which presuppose their presence. Different degrees of entrenchment gives a dynamics for differential rates of change in the theory of evolution without ever bringing in population genetics. That's why it can be used for cultural evolution, <coughs> but it applies also to genes. Um, uh, I want to go back to something that played a, a big role in evolutionary developmental biology an observation first by <coughs> embryologist Carl Ernst von Baer, called von Baer's Law, and that is to note that earlier stages of diverse organisms are more similar than later ones. To Darwin, this suggested their common origins. But this earlier evolutionary conservation is explained also by the greater downstream dependencies or the generative entrenchment of earlier features. Um, this idea was significantly elaborated by morpho mor uh, for morphological traits before genetic data, genetic data was available by Rupert Riedel. Uh, but the explosion of genomic data uh, giving uh, comparative phylogenetic information has made possible detailed genomic analysis of increasing resolution and breadth, like those of uh, recently deceased Eric Davidson and Douglas Irwin on genetic circuitry. Uh, this is a, a, a figure from Davidson's book, uh, Genetic Regulatory System, in 2006. What he does is he does cross phyletic comparison of a circuit uh, making uh, uh, heart progenitor uh, cells, uh, and he looks at the same circuit in Drosophila, and then in vertebrates. You might say, well, Drosophila is very specific, and vertebrates is very general. But the point is, it's so important that it's conserved across all vertebrates. Um, and what he does is he then abstracts features common to both of these, and this is still, as it were, architectural features of a presumably even more primitive uh, 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 circuit. Uh, now what's interesting in this, and uh, Davidson is thought of as a genetic reductionist, but what's invariant across this is not, gene, is not DNA sequences, or even genes, it's functional roles. So Davidson's own work leads to look at a higher level of organization, organizational features. Okay, one of several, and now I'm gonna tie into the physics. One of several characterizations of self-organization, uh, symmetry breaking, is particularly relevant to generative entrenchment. Generic properties of interest emerge or self-organize through self-amplifying deviations from conditions of homogeneity or symmetry. Thus, examples of pattern formation, like that of the famous beluso jabotinsky reagent, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it here, in which spiral colored patterns of activity emerge from local density fluctuations in the reactants and expand to cover the, and entrain the whole system. The emergence of differential entrenchment in complex systems is such a process. Now, consider a system, say, a gene control network, in which all of its elements are equally strongly selected or have equivalent amounts of generative entrenchment or downstream dependency. Note that this homogeneity is unlikely for any differentiated system uh, whose parts would have different conditions and consequences of failure. And virtually all interesting mechanisms are made of differentiated parts. Now suppose mutations add new downstream elements depending upon one or more, but not all, 
of the existing elements. Any such mutation would increase the generative entrenchment of those elements. But then their loss through other mutations would be more strongly selected again. Thus, their expected lifetime in a system evolving under a selection mutation balance and their chance of acquiring still more entrenching mutations would both be increased. This is a symmetry breaking process favoring, di favoring differential generative entrenchment. And this is, in some sense, the deepest reason why differential generative entrenchment is a universal in adaptive uh, selected systems. Um, so not only is differential generative entrenchment characteristic of any differentiated system, but it also would emerge from symmetry breaking transitions in any system that don't already show it. It's thus robustly generic and a fundamental architectural feature in evolving systems. Both contingent elements and generic ones can become entrenched. That is, sort of accidental <coughs> local uh, fiddles can, if other things come to depend upon it, can. But, and this is how you get some of the, um, well, Darwin once said, nature is as much contraction as it is contrivance. This is how you get some of the uh, enormous adaptive radiation of kludges uh, in, uh, uh, in adaptive systems. They just must be stable for long enough to acquire further dependencies, and this gives them greater chances of surviving to capture still more. Generative entrenchment is ubiquitous and important for both biology and for culture. Indeed, in biology, generative entrenchment is, is the main reason that history matters, and that historical information is so revealing. I would argue that it must also be a major factor in the importance of history and human technology and culture as well, although I don't think it's the only reason for the importance of history there. Entrenchment generates not only conservation, but also a framework on which different adaptive designs can be constructed. These are uh, three figures from Buffon's uh, 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 Histoire Naturelle, uh, showing the skeleton of a uh, baboon here, weighing 40 pounds, an elephant here, weighing 15,000 pounds, and notice the elephant, by comparison, has piano legs. It's very thick legs, and the reason is you have to preserve surface to volume, uh, volume ratio, that is, uh, size goes into volume, but the strength uh, of the leg goes into the surface area, so if you, an elephant's not going to break its leg every time it steps, it has to get differentially fatter leg. It also has uh, a specific adaptation, namely uh, massive uh, elaboration of the upper incisors into tusks. And then here at the other extreme is a flying fox, uh, 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 a fruit bat of Southeast Asia, uh, a bat that weighs one to two pounds with, again, with a common vertebral body plan. Note finer bones allowing lighter weight, selected <coughs> for flying, and remarkably fine extended digits to support wings made of elaborate interphal interphalangeal membranes. Despite metrical changes, the topologies in bone are preserved across all three structures. Why was the skeletal form preserved across these adaptive variations? Can it be changed? Many aspects of the functional phenotype, the whole organism, depend on this architecture. But in addition, processes generating it are themselves important for other structures and processes, as seen in the next slide. This is a picture of a 16-week human fetus. And I don't know if you can see it in there. There are two arrows here, uh, and there are little uh, things coming out from the spinal column there. Uh, that's the conversion of a cervical vertebra to a thoracic vertebra. Uh, or sorry, a thoracic vertebra to a cervical vertebra. And you might say, well, you know, what difference does that make? Uh, you know, I can easily have a couple of spines out here. But it takes a, a Hox gene mutation to change that identity. And the Hox genes are very deep. So uh, this uh, is accompanied by correlative anomalies, including uh, frequent early cancers and varied organ system abnormalities or deletions, ranging from missing kidneys to absence of a corpus callosum. So you see all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. um, now, so to make, a, now I want to look at what you have to do to get away with making a deeply entrenched change. To make a deeply entrenched change that works, it's crucial to preserve the core functions of the system. This applies to biological systems, to technological systems, such as the computer, 
and the conceptual systems, such as scientific theories. I will consider one each of the last two. Uh, I want to compare the IBM 709 to the IBM 7090. Only a few of you will remember uh, this old... Uh, these old I more numbers. than remember it. I wrote <laughs> programs on <laughs> <laughs> In 1958, IBM released the vacuum-tuned 709 scientific computer. It was a major uh, step forward. The first computer to run Fortran was also the first to emulate an older computer, the IBM 704 so it could continue to run older software. This backwards compatibility became a requirement for newer computers. It illustrates my point about preserving core functional requirements. IBM then put the 709 team to work producing the 709T, which stands for transistor. Except, of course, everybody immediately started calling it the 7090, 7090s, a logically identical computer substituting transistors for tubes. This is conservation of function in spades. Released a year later, the 7090 was smaller, more reliable, with much lower, i.e. 5 volt power requirements. You didn't need any high voltage, uh, uh, high, uh, voltage filament transformers for the vacuum tube. Uh, much reduced need for air conditioning <coughs> and half the cost. It also ran six times faster. With higher reliability and much less downtime, its higher speed allowed real-time control of processes that the 709 could not manage. But for all of these changes, the 7090 was logically identical as far as running programs was concerned. This conserved function made it quick to develop, and its other characteristics uh, occasioned by this deep modification gave it much wider distribution and use. Now, for scientific change, a newer theory must generate the core successes of an older theory as limiting cases. The older theory cannot be overthrown without meeting the condition. Note, it needn't generate them in the same way. Uh, Michelle Yatsen's studies of the theoretical changes from classical mechanics and electromagnetic theory, which I could not retell for you, uh, to relativistic and quantum mechanics, have demonstrated in five different cases that newer theories were built upon the scaffolding of the older ones, and the older ones are still sometimes embedded uh, in the newer theories. These examples are deep and convincing, but technically demanding. So consider an easier but important example. But by the way, uh, a trivial example is the fact that the Lorentz transformations uh, go uh, to the Newtonian transformations and the limit as V over C goes to zero. Uh, but uh, uh, Janssen goes much deeper. In 1842, Darwin was faced with a deep anomaly for his developing theory. The organization of specialized labor of the different castes of social insects contributing to the welfare of the colony made them a paradigm for the beneficent wisdom of the creator, the then dominant natural theological story of adaptive design in nature. But for Darwin, this posed a problem. How could the adaptations of sterile castes of social insects have evolved? and be passed on to descendants. This seemed a direct challenge to his theory of evolution by natural selection, which required variations in organismal form that caused fitness differences and were inherited. This case would surely come up immediately, too, upon presentation of Darwin's theory. And he described it to a friend in the letter in 1842 as the rock upon which my theory could found it. A solution was not obvious, but according to Bob Richards' account, uh, Darwin didn't hit upon the solution until actually writing up the origin of species in 1858. Uh, this is actually a uh, picture from uh, the Scheutzer Kupfer Bible, which is a three-volume illustrated Bible, and it's full of uh, uh, pictures about designs of nature. It shows, by the way, that natural theology was not special to England, but in fact uh, was uh, widely on the continent, too. Um, so uh, Darwin co-opted the social insects, um, uh, which were a key moral highlight <coughs> in natural theology. The lesson, work hard and don't object to your place in the social hierarchy. Uh, down at the bottom of this figure, you can see it says uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse uh, 3, uh, which is, uh, look thou a sluggard to the ant, consider her ways and be wise. Uh, <laughs> um, he had to modify a theory to accommodate colony selection uh, in order to do so. Uh, that is, the queen was the reproductive element and the others were just like 
more, uh, morphological adaptation. Um, the hierarchy of adaptations attributed to the insect colony was preserved across the revolutionary co-option in all major details and only further anchored by new information. The centrality of this case is illustrated by the fact that it's in the sculpture bit. Okay, uh, notice that the changes only affected purposes at the top. In effect, they substituted natural selection for a divine creator, uh, and adaptations all the way down were preserved. Uh, okay, so Darwin's co-option of the widespread studies and adaptations supported the competing account of natural theology it midwifed a revolution in biology. He preserved the vast majority of their adaptationist analyses, but just substituted natural selection for a benevolent creator. This strategy uh, 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 persisted through successive revolutions of neo-Darwinism uh, in population genetics and molecular genetics and evolutionary developmental biology, each with major and sometimes foundational changes, but preserving enough of the original still to be called Darwin's theory make Darwin's origin still required reading for evolutionary biology and training. Now I want to switch to modularity, which is another important design principle. Um, but we, in this case, we need to distinguish between top-down and bottom-up modularity, characteristic of evolved and engineering context, respectively. I start with an organizational problem for evolved systems, which I'll call the big ball of mud. Um, after a paper uh, published online by two computer scientists at the uh, University at Urbana. Uh, they say, look, a big ball of mud is haphazardly structured, sprawling, sloppy, duct tape and bailing wire, spaghetti for the dollar. We've all seen them. These systems show unmistakable signs of unregulated growth and repeated expedient repair. Information shared promiscuously among distant elements of the system often to the point where near, nearly all of the important information becomes global and duplicated. The overall structure of the system may never have been well defined, but if it was, it may have eroded beyond recognition. Now, if evolution proceeds through a series of contextually advantageous layered clues, as I would argue, how is this different, and how do we ex escape its consequences for having an unmanageable mess? While there's a means of escape for biological evolution, it's not readily available to software programmers, although they're actually, they made adaptations uh, to get uh, some of the features. I think that this, as well as generation of robustness and modularity of quasi-independent elements, allowing evolution, that is top-down uh, modularity, all likely have a common cause, at least in sexual species, in the operation of recombination. And in such systems, functional organization remains relatively stable through the action of generative entrenchment. A generation ago, in 1966, George Williams wrote a very influential book that by the time I got here in 1970 was required reading for all graduate students in evolutionary biology. He taught us that genes were the only thing sufficiently <coughs> stable to be evolutionary units. And genes showed significant epistasis, nonlinear gene interaction, in complex combinatorial ways. So a change in either genes or environment should change phenotype, which, so the argument goes, must be less stable than either. Since phenotypes are products of genes and environment, and genes are scrambled in sexual recombination, phenotypes should be very unstable. Guess what? They aren't. Uh, despite all of the nonlinear gene interactions and new combinations, the most offspring phenotypes are not only of the same species as the parent, but reflect their many detailed morphological, behavioral, and biochemical traits. Thus, we may say that a child has her mother's eyes, her father's forehead, and her grandmother's disposition. Uh, young human mothers have roughly 50% viable embryos. How is this possible? Why aren't most new zygotes immediately inviolable? Imagine randomly recombining computer programs. Uh, <laughs> furthermore, if there weren't significant heritability both of fitness and of individual characteristics from parent to offspring, evolution would be impossible. We wouldn't be here. Andreas Wagner shows that evolution has tuned the phenotype for robustness of essential characteristics at multiple levels, from redundant DNA on up, in the face of environmental and genetic variations in all essential properties. I've argued since 1987 
that sexual recombination is a major driver of robustness in sexual species. Given genetic variability, about 5% or more of loci, so that about 1,000 out of 20,000 loci would be segregating in humans. And random recombination of genes and offspring, and widespread epistasis among alleles at different loci, and non-additivity among alleles at the same loci, recombination must act as a strong filter against strongly negative epistatic fitness variation among different recombinations. And more recently, in 2008, Libnat and all, including uh, Mark um, Feldman, uh, uh, a giant of population genetics, have since confirmed this claim in simulation, arguing that selection in the presence of sex robustly favors alleles that do well across multiple backgrounds, i.e., that are robust. So, sorry, can I just ask you real quick, what is epistasis of genes? Epistasis is um, uh, effects of genes at one locus on genes at another, uh, and it's nonlinear. Okay. okay. So this is an instance of the kind of complex stability possible in open, nonlinear, highly context-dependent, and facultative biological or adaptive system. I would want to argue that similar things are true for evolved adaptive systems in general, including complex, context-dependent, and conditioned, conditional organismal environment artifact multi-agent complexes. Or else we couldn't teach or make human culture or other forms of coordinated behavior work. This is sometimes a product of design practices. Thus, object-oriented programming is designed to facilitate easy recombination and reuse of elements of code. In our elaboration of culture and a biological organization, the operation of scaffolding is a common element. Now I'm going to bring in another design feature. Scaffolding is structure-like dynamical interactions with performing individuals that are means to which other structures or competencies are constructed or acquired by individuals or organizations. Uh, thus, the cell scaffolds gene replication and expression so fully that one wonders whether the relevant reproductive unit in the cell uh, rather than the gene or genome. By the way, I was delighted to hear scaffolding used uh, in a <laughs> couple of the talks. Uh, it fits. So there's relevant scaffolding for individuals, which include family structure to raise the young infant, uh, schools, curricula, professions, interest groups, laws. There's scaffolding for organizations, so focusing on businesses, corporate law, manufacturers' organizations, chambers of commerce, and distribution networks. Artifacts that uh, give scaffolding include machine tools, written language, clothing, housing, cars, computers, seminar tables, and software. Uh, and then finally, there's infrastructure of scaffolding, Scaffolding which becomes so general in its application that it's hard to key it into any serving any particular function. So language, schools, roads, sea, rail, and air networks, shopping centers, gas, water, power, telephone, distribution warehouses, and networks, public transportation, and either now. And I would argue that as a first approximation, the whole of uh, culture is an elaboration of scaffolding to allow us to acquire greater abilities and act in a coordinated fashion. Uh, those of you from Chicago will recognize this. It's the scaffolding uh, to uh, uh, fix the tower of what Ch the Chicago Theological Seminary uh, used to be. Um, and the, the repairs cost so much that they went bankrupt and sold out to the business school. Uh, so, oh, sorry, to the economics department. Uh, so here we have some competition too. Anyway, notice it's made of interchangeable parts that can be assembled in different ways. As we see here, this is the, uh, the um, uh, a restaurant at Central Lounge at LAX. Um, and here's some biocultural evolution. Here's a parasitic vine that scaffolds itself across a two-lane highway, and the highway scaffolds cars, which scaffolds human transportation, on a wire which scaffolds telecommunications and power distribution, while animal parasites in the background, tent caterpillars, construct their reproductive niche, webbing branches together as they strip the leaves. Now, scaffolding as culture can be much richer and more interdependent, however. Consider that construction and maintenance of curricula presupposes schools, classes, textbooks, textbook publishers and writers, professional societies and specialists, for research, develop, and report on new materials, 
teacher training and certification procedures. And now for a big industry, like the automotive industry, the yellow pages reflect the diversity of support roles and spin-off occupations. I looked at the Chicago 2001 yellow pages, uh, and this is a rough breakdown of how many column inches, that five columns per page, there were in the 93 pages uh, on automotive industries. You see an enormous proliferation of uh, uh, various specialized activities. Okay. Now I want to go to bottom-up modularity and combinatorial entrenchments because this has been the source of multiple revolutions both in biology and culture. The development of a combinatorial... Is that 10 minutes? Okay. The development of a combinatorial alphabet for the construction of diverse complex artifacts was crucial to technology. Uh, Bottom-up modularity is the key here. So I'll talk about the significance and evolution of modularity, particularly in technology. Modularity is a recurrent theme in evolved uh, objects and systems. Uh, for living systems, it's inevitable because reproduction produces like modules. Um, I, um, Modularity is common in biology and a topic of discussion for several reasons. First of all, it's easier to make a system with lots of similar parts <coughs> because there are fewer part types to code for. Indeed, reproduction makes maximally identical parts to start with. In fact, the problem of development can be seen as how you start with identical parts that uh, become differentiated. Uh, and often, uh, a complex system will use even similar parts in dissimilar roles. Um, this is a list I've made, just thinking about it, of what things you can do with a nut-bolt combination. Uh, so I'm going to just mention three of these. Uh, the most common is it acts as a structural connector, uh, tying two pieces of, of a structure together. But doing the same thing, only weakening the nut and bolt, making it uh, have a lower capacity, it can act as a shear pin which is designed to fail before any other elements of the structure would uh, happen and uh, reduce the damage of uh, overload. Um, and then finally, another extremely important thing is the, um, uh, a measuring device, a micrometer, uh, which uh, with calibration and, and rule uh, was crucial to the advent of uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution through the design of interchangeable parts, uh, the production of interchangeable parts. Um, uh, this is a remarkable uh, book that I found uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, it's called Engineers Illustrated Thesaurus. Instead of words having a similar meaning, these are parts having a similar uh, uh, design feature and adapted to different contexts. Um, so uh, a system is easier to modify. So um, um, uh, a system is easier to modify if you can adapt to local circumstances by changing one or a few parts without systematically changing the whole, which is both harder and more likely to have deleterious consequences. So we have quasi-independent parts and near decomposability. Uh, and third, if you have a small number of parts, each of which can be put together in different ways, you can make a large number of different kinds of things with a small alphabet of parts. Um, this is combinatorial parts. So, in summary, modular parts can be polyfunctional, as a function of their differentiated roles in a complex system, quasi-independent, and combinatorial generative. Our artifacts show massive modularity on multiple hierarchical scales, and it was pivotal to our technological evolution. Um, Entrenchment can happen rapidly and massively when a part or tool or property of a part becomes part of a combinatorial algebra for creating an ensemble of possible systems. These parts thus become standardized uh, and can serve diverse functions in different systems, which increases their standardization and fixity. So standards for nuts and bolts will persist indefinitely as entrenchment compels a continued need for, say, both metric and English parts and tools. So let's dissect the stages through which this can happen a little further. Um, and I believe similar stages are characteristic of, uh, uh, of the, wherever you get combinatorial explosion. So first of all, you start with non-interchangeable parts. Though they often may be made from the same patterns, they uh, are assembled, they're co-tuned to work together on a system-by-system -system basis. 
For example, parts for the brown bass musket used by redcoats during the American Revolution uh, were assembled in this way. But you can't uh, fix a broken flintlock on one brown bass musket, musket by putting in one from another. It won't fit. With higher accuracy, interchangeable parts. Only within manufacture and only, often only at the population level. For example, can you find a fit in that basket relatively quickly uh, of a part? That, however, doesn't give interchangeability. It gives manufacturing ease. Standardized parts across manufacturers with coordinated settings of standard, which become self-reinforcing in a coordination game. Consider, okay, I'm probably going to run five minutes over. Okay. Um, <laughs> consider SAE standards for nuts and bolts. Um, this happened at Harper's Ferry and Springfield Armories uh, in 1841. After uh, nearly 30 years of attempting to do it, it's not easy. Uh, machine tools are crucial here to uh, generate sufficient reproducibility. Their adjustable and repeatable settings also allow the same tools to make diverse kinds of parts. Third, distribution of standardized parts. For example, you have hardware stores, electronics, plumbing, equipment stores. This is an often ignored requirement. The right parts must be in the right place at the right time, calling for elaboration of coordinated transport mechanisms, like metabolism. Parts become more polyfunctional and more generatively entrenched. Different varieties of parts for differential specialized applications arrive. Uh, witness the bolts, uh, uh, the threaded connectors on that uh, picture. Uh, the aspects that are standardized become categorical. Metric and, Eng and English threads are incompatible, barring use of replacement parts or tools designed for one or the other, um, one on the other. Now generatively entrenched, they become narrowly specialized and replaceable only wholesale, or broadly applied and virtually irreplaceable. With innovations where one artifact replaces another, if standard formats affect uh, compatibility, backwards compatibility becomes an issue. This is preservation of function, the generative entrenchment. Can you still read all the formats, all the file formats in your word process? Here are the bolts again. Now I want to talk about the text in which this appears. Um, Herkimer's remarkable text is worthy of special note. This thesaurus is organized by kinds of mechanism and within kinds of mechanism by more specialized function. It creates a design alphabet of alternatives. They aren't strict functional equivalents since each is specialized to a more particular kind of application. And they're types, not particular parts. This text also encourages engineers to break complex design problems into subproblems. This is Simon Nair decomposability. And to use existing solutions rather than to invent yet other variants unless absolutely necessary. So engineering practice becomes standardized as well. And notice, and the effect is to involve these design principles in engineering practice. Uh, uh, okay. So going on, we have chunking and hierarchical modularity. So we have not just screws, but coils, starter motors, engine, kit houses, and franchises. Um, this leads to modular assembly stages, with sub-assemblies constructed in different <coughs> places than final assembly. That happens in the cell, too, by the way. It leads to specialized distribution. Auto parts stores uh, need for directories and coordination with assembly stages, including just-in-time stocking facilitated by computerized inventory control and containerized shipping. Um, Sub-assemblies may be black box. Um, and here's another page from Herkimer showing uh, geared assemblies that perform a really large variety of functions. Uh, we have resign of non-modular things for modular construction at lower time and cost, often to use non-optimal but easily available components. Uh, and we'll see that in Sears kit houses below. We have competitive elimination of non-modularized and non-standardized designs that are more expensive, require more labor and knowledge to repair or support. So you can't order a standard replacement window for a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Standardized parts allow for pre-manufacturing, local availability, standardized tools, and standardized training for construction and repair. So uh, Sears kit houses were marketed from 1908 to about 1934 
uh, incre an increasing variety and sophistication. Actually, what happened is uh, uh, Rosenwald uh, noticed that most of the uh, purchases of things in Sears catalogs were by homeowners. So they thought, oh, okay, if we can make kit houses, we'll generate more, a larger market for us. <laughs> um, they had about 30,000 parts in an average kit coming in two or more boxcars to a railroad siding near you. Labor saving, pre-cut and labeled and standardized with choices of construction quality level, this was a high level decision that changed hundreds to thousands of part specifications. Mode of heating and lighting, indoor plumbing, and of course the furnishings from your Sears catalog. Choices with generative classifications like these saved hundreds of thousands of detailed decisions. Uh, steam versus hot water heat, anyone? Uh, you could get it from Sears and a coordinated set of light fixtures to fit your trim style. These are all electric lights, but Sears also sold gas fixtures that look the same. Uh, and even the plugs, actually, for gas fixtures look the same. Um, so um, choose your door styles and then door hardware, from attic to basement and inside and outside. These housing designs are modular all the way through. Um, next step. Black box, <coughs> this is removing the ability to disassemble, um, for example, in distribution of parts. This is accessory packages for cars. There's no reason you couldn't get different combinations of accessories, except the manufacturers use this for various functions. Uh, second, in manufacturing generating subsystems that are designed to be replaced whole. Or three, uh, in foregoing expertise for dealing with a disassembled black box. Along with this, we have lost skills, blacksmithing, component repair. Can you get a radio fix or a car generator rebuilt? As I did in Canada, not in the U.S., on a Saturday afternoon in 1970. Exploitation of combinatorial possibilities of modular design, e.g., alternatives and materials, selling of dec decorative door frames, mantelpieces, bookcases, cabinetry complexes being sold in Sears House. Now, this required design so the add-on accessories are consistent with each other, both st stylistically and mechanically. Um, yeah, very soon. Okay. Uh, I have just about uh, three very quick slides. You, you, you're just at 46 minutes, so okay, you said you're going to go five hours. Okay. okay. A look at the number of specialized accessories, computers, and cars. Now, note that modularizing something into parts can disentrench their organization by making it more readily disassembled and rearranged, at the same time as they entrench and standardize the components as a common alphabet. Training for modularity. This can include autotelic folk models, tinker toys, Lincoln logs, erector sets, Lego, etc. Teach engineering compositional paradigm and polyfunctionality. Use the same part to make different kinds of things. So the lesson is buy your kid an erector set for kid Christmas and play with it. Here we are. I bought that. Uh, um, for kids only? Well, in his book, The Box, about the development of containerized transport, Mark Levinson describes how Matson shipping engineer, Les Harlander, prototyped and trusted the arrangement for a problematic lifting spreader on a shipside crane on his son's erector set over Christmas. Uh, you can see the kids say, Dad, come on, let me play with you. <laughs> uh, so, I'm talking about generative entrenchment and self-organization, robustness and recombination, combinatorial modularity, bottom-up and top-down, and top-down modularity versus big ball of mud. So I've discussed a number of factors important to the architecture of evolving systems. Notice how richly they interact with one another. In their interaction, they also play a role in explaining <coughs> other features in ways I haven't had time to discuss here. The stability of functional architectures, the constraints on productive changes and evolvability. Thank you.